Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so we're delighted to have Demalia, a long-term visitor and intern here, tell us about optimization problems in network connectivity. Thank you, Val. Uh, is the mic switched on? Yeah, thanks. So let's start with uh, tracing the history of telecommunication. And perhaps the desire for a large scale long distance network started with the invention of the telegraph in the middle of the 19th century. So much so that by the early 20th century, there was already an extensive network of submarine cables connecting the world's continents. Of course, over the next 100 years, as new technologies developed, new networks came up as well. For example, the telephone network in the US was fairly complicated by the middle of the 20th century, and we have the modern day internet. But what connects all of these networks is the desire to connect individuals, which means a natural set of questions for any such network is how good are these connections. For example, how many cable failures can the US to Europe's connection survive in a telegraphic network? Or how do we increase the capacity of a connection? Say, how do we increase the capacity between Boston and Seattle? Or in the internet, how many link failures can cause it to get disconnected into multiple pieces? So these are questions which are limited not just to communication networks, but also to many other kinds of networks. For example, road networks, or electrical circuits, or even social networks and process workflows, which are just virtual networks. Okay. So in all of these networks, we have seen that the key desire is to connect entities, and therefore the key questions are related to the connectivity of these networks. So instead of asking these questions specific to these applications, can we abstractly define some of these questions so that we can propose uni unifying solutions for all of these applications? And if we want to abstractly classify connectivity questions, then there are two broad classes of questions we come up with. The first are called network analysis questions which is the finding the connectivity properties of existing networks. So I'm given a network, what is the minimum cut in this network? Or what is the sparsest cut? What kind of flows can we sustain between two points in the network? The second class of broad class of questions are what are called network design questions. And here we don't have an existing network. Rather, we are given priced network elements, nodes and, vert or nodes and edges, and we want to put them together to achieve some desired connectivity properties. So we want to achieve some desired rate of flow between two points or achieve some desired robustness in the network. Okay? So these are the two classes of questions I will focus on today. In particular, I'll talk about two, two problems or two groups of problems. For network analysis questions, I'll talk about minimum cut problems. And there will be several problems I'll talk about in this domain. I'll also talk about network design and the problem I'll specifically concentrate on are the Steiner tree problems and these are these are two fundamental problems in these classes. And towards the end of the talk, I'll also bring up a third class of problems called cut sparsification, which is very closely related to network analysis, but does not quite fall in either of these two categories. Okay, so that's the general plan of the talk. We'll start with minimum cuts, then we'll go to Steiner trees, and we'll end with sparsification. So let's start with minimum cuts. There are two kinds of min cut problems that have received a lot of attention. One are called the local connectivity problems, the other class is called global connectivity. In local connectivity, we are given a graph, and we are given two particular vertices, two selected vertices in the graph called terminals. So here it, these terminals are denoted by S and T. And the goal is to find the smallest cuts that separate S from T. In this case, these cuts have three edges each. In global connectivity problems, or global min cuts, the goal is simply to find the smallest cuts in the network. We are not given any terminals, it's just overall what are the smallest cuts in the network. Right? So of course both of these represent the fragility of the network to failures. In part, and, and since these are foundational questions in connectivity, there has been a lot of interest over the years. And many algorithms have been proposed to find the local connectivity of a single vertex pair. This is connected to the max flow question, for example, by duality. And similarly, there have been many algorithms proposed to find a single global min cut in the graph. But what we will focus on in this talk are not these algorithms, 
But how do we find the local connectivity of all pairs of vertices? So if you think of any application, it's not, it's not feasible to say that I'll find the local connectivity of Boston and Seattle today throughout my computation completely find the local connectivity of two other locations tomorrow. Instead, it would be much better if you could find the local connectivities of all pairs of vertices in a graph and encode them in a data structure from which we can easily query any particular connectivity. So this is very similar to pairwise distances, for example, in a graph. We often t try to find pairwise distances for all pairs of vertices, then encode them in a data structure and query that data structure efficiently. Right? So this is the problem we will focus on for local connectivities. For global connectivities, imagine that you want to increase the robustness of a network. Now, if you want to do that, it's not sufficient to just find one min cut. Right? I, if, I, if I increase the number of edges in one min cut, there could be other min cuts lurking around, which still reduce the, uh, the effectiveness of my uh, increase in robustness. Right? So what we would be interested in is, can we find all the global min cuts in a network? How fast can we find these two quantities? Okay? So let's start with local connectivity. As I said, the goal here is to find the local connectivity of all vertex pairs. And this question was asked as early as 1961, when Gomery and Hu came up with, an ex with a very, very elegant data structure that showed that all these n square different min cuts, they're n square vertex pairs, so they're n square local connectivities. All these n square different connectivities can actually be represented in linear space, in just O of n space. So the focus shifts to whether we can construct this data structure, whether we can construct this linear size representation of all these n square min cuts in a graph. Only talking about undirected graphs? Yes, yes. Um, only talking about undirected graphs here. That's right. Okay. So that is that is the focus of the first part of the talk. And there have been many algorithms proposed to construct a gomory hu tree or other data structures that find all the local connectivities in a graph. Now the best running time at the moment is m times n to the three halves. Okay. And I'll 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 show you why where this running time comes from. But if you look at all these sequence of algorithms over the last 40 to 50 years, we see something very surprising. All these algorithms are based on exactly the same idea. So take these set of n square min cuts, identify some linear number of min cuts that are critical, from which I can construct my entire gomory hu tree. And then once I've identified these min cuts, use your favorite local min cut algorithm to find these min cuts and put them together in a gomory hu tree. All the, all the previous algorithms exactly follow the same recipe, and this is the recipe they follow. Where's the difference? Well, there are differences in how you identify these min cuts, and also differences in how you find the min cuts once you have identified it, them. Right? So the basic algorithm for finding all local connectivities in a graph has remained unchanged for more than 40 years, which obviously begs the question, is there something we are missing out by focusing only on this one recipe of finding gomory hu trees? So to answer this question, let's step back and try to see what a gomory hu tree is. So here's a definition. It's a weighted tree on the same set of vertices as the input graph. So let's say here's an input graph on the left. I construct a weighted tree on the same set of vertices, and in, it must have the following property. If I look at any pair of vertices, let's say S and T, then if I go to the tree and look at the min cut separating S from T, this min cut on the tree is, is very simple. It's simply the lightest edge on the path connecting S to T. So here's a min cut that separates S from T in the tree. I take that min cut, bring it back to my graph. The graph and the tree are on the same set of vertices. The cuts are, correspond to each other. Then this, this cut should satisfy two properties. One, it should be a min cut of bit separating S from T in the graph as well. And two, the number of edges in this cut should be exactly equal to the weight on that edge in the tree. Okay? Which means that the tree really represents all pairwise connectivity values. Right? For any pair of vertices from the tree, we can easily find the local connectivity of that pair. So this is a gomory hu tree. How do we construct it using local min cuts? And it's actually a very simple algorithm. So initially what we do is we select any arbitrary pair of vertices, say S and T. We find a local min cut for that pair. So here's a min cut. That identifies an edge in the gomory hu tree for us. Right? So corres corresponding to that min cut, we get an edge whose weight is exactly equal to the number of edges in that cut. Once we have gotten that edge, we know that each side of that cut will be separated by the edge in the tree as well. So once we have identified that edge, we can recurse in the following manner. What we do is we create 
two instances of the problem, where in each instance we retain one side of the cut and contract the other side. So here, for example, we create two instances. So if you go back, you'll see that in one instance I've contracted the bottom half of the cut. In the other instance, I've contracted the top half of the cut. And now I recurse on these individual instances by again picking two vertices on the side that I did not contract and repeating this until I get all the n minus 1 edges in the gomori tree. Okay. Which means that really what I am doing is n minus 1 local min cut computations. Every min cut computation reveals an edge in the tree. There are n minus 1 edges. The best algorithm to find a local min cut takes time m times square root of n and that's where the m times n to the 3 halves running time comes from. Okay. So this is what the state of the art is. But again, is there something missing here? And one thing that this, uh, this, comp this algorithm is ignoring, or this, yeah? So when you say state of the art, this is before the, uh, the work of Madhuri et al. on finding max flows fast? Didn't think that be used? No, the problem is that this entire uh, recipe only works if it's an exact algorithm for min cut. If it's an approximate algorithm, then once you contract, the min cuts change. If it's an exact min cut algorithm, you can do this contraction. Otherwise, you can't. And Madhuri et al.'s algorithm is only for um, uh, only getting you an approximate min cut. It doesn't get you an exact one. So the approximations basically build up on the recursion tree. So uh, if, if we look at uh, if we look at the comparison, a comparison between local min cut and global min cut algorithms, then till the early 90s, when these algorithms were being developed. It was thought that local min cuts are easier. In fact, all the algorithms for local min cuts were faster. Global min cuts were typically found by repeated local min cut computations. But things have changed over the last 20 years. In fact, now we can find a global min cut in approximately linear time, whereas local min cuts are still quite far from linear time. So a wild idea is perhaps in this recipe we can change the local min cut computations to global min cut computations. Can I change the local min cuts to global min cuts? What happens? Well, here's a graph. I find a global min cut in the graph. It does identify an edge in the komori tree for me. So I can use the same idea. Right? This identifies an edge. I contract the two sides to create two instances and recurse. The problem, however, is in the recursion. What happens in the next stage? Well, we are finding global min cuts. So we keep finding the same min cut and we don't make any progress whatsoever. Now the problem is that we are, by insisting on finding global min cuts in the recursive stages, we are not being able to find cuts that, that split the part of the graph that I did not contract. Right? Because I have to find small cuts, but cuts that split the part of the graph I did not contract. So to do this, we introduce a new problem called the Steiner min cut problem which finds the smallest cut that separates a set of terminals. So I give you a graph. I also allow you to give me a set of terminals in the graph, which is a set of vertices. And I want the smallest cut, which splits these terminals into two pieces. So if we replace global min cuts by Steiner min cut computations. So how is this different from multi-way? Sorry? How is this different from multi-way? Well, multi-way, you give many pairs. And you want each pair to get separated. Here, I am not put enforcing any conditions on how this set gets separated. I only want this set to be separated. You only want to make partition into two halves, uh, not necessarily that they're all different. Actually, you just want one term. Oh, okay. Sorry, two parts. At least one. Okay. I want at least one terminal in each of the two sides. Yes. OK. So if you replace global min cuts by Steiner min cuts, what happens? Well, at the top level, at the first level of recursion, I'll define my terminals as the entire set of vertices. So it's just a global min cut at that point. At the next level, what I do is I define my set of terminals as the size I did not contract. And then I make progress, right? Because the new cuts I get actually split this size. So this gives me a correct algorithm. After n minus 1 iterations, I'll get a gomori hu tree. What's the runtime? Well, one problem is that if you notice carefully, this uh, notion of a Steiner min cut generalizes both local and global min cuts. But if I define my terminals as the entire set of vertices, that's a global min cut. If I define my, term, my set of terminals as just two vertices, that's a local min cut. So clearly, I can't hope to be bettering the runtime of a local min cut computation here. In fact, 
the best algorithm we could come up with for finding a Steiner min cut takes more time than a local min cut. In fact, it takes time m times n. Right? So have we made any progress? We have a new algorithm, but really we are losing in the runtime. Now comes the key aspect of Steiner min cuts. And this is that it gives an advantage, not just that it gives an alternative approach, but it gives a very key structural ad advantage over local min cuts. So if you think of a local min cut computation, what does it do? It essentially computes a flow between S and T. So a flow is just a collection of paths. Now once I've computed a set of paths between S and T, in the next step, when S and T get separated, these paths are completely useless. So I have to start from scratch again. What a Steiner min cut does is it computes a set of trees. It packs trees rooted at a vertex S. Now S goes to one of my two sub-problems. All these trees go with S and can be used without any, any change whatsoever. So there's a, even though we are doing n n minus one Steiner min cut computations, there's significant overlap of the work I'm doing at these various computation nodes. In fact, if we do an amortization argument, we can show that we get an algorithm that runs in time m times n, which is the same as just a single Steiner min cut computation. Okay, the whole entire n minus one Steiner min cut computations amortizes to just one single computation. And this improves the runtime for finding all the local min cuts. In fact, it turns out that this is optimal pro provided certain cut conditions hold, and this was proved by Abbott and Zhao. So quick recap, there are two things here. One, that local min cuts are not necessary for computing gomori hu trees and can be replaced by Steiner min cuts. Two, even though a single Steiner min cut computation is slow, slower than a local min cut computation, a sequence of Steiner min cut computations is much faster than a single look, uh, than a sequence of local min cut computations. And that's where we get a new algorithm. Okay. So having looked at a local connectivity, yeah, sorry. What do you mean by conditional result? So uh, either this algorithm cannot be improved or a certain dynamic cut condition is false, which is hypothesized to be true. But we saw the running time cannot be improved. Yes. So if you improve that, you improve something, something else. Uh, no, yeah, you prove, you disprove some other hypothesis that is generally believed to be true. Also, so you used usually that the sequence of uh, Steiner vertices is a chain or something. Is that crucial? Uh, no, I didn't get you. So the sequence of so you have, you have a set of terminals. In the next set, you get that set of terminals splits into two sets of terminals. Yes. And the fact that you chose one vertex to root your trees at at the parent is useful in the one where the parent goes. All right, so having looked at uh, local min cuts, let's move on to global connectivity. As I promised you, the problem we would be looking at is finding all global min cuts. How many global min cuts are there in a graph? For all we know, there are exponentially many min cuts. There are exponentially many cuts in a graph. So really, the first question here is, how do we even count the number of cuts? And if we can count them, how do we represent them? It turns out that one can show that there are only quadratic number of global min cuts. And not only that, that all of these cuts can be represented as in the local connectivity case in just linear space. And this is called a cactus. And this, this is a data structure that has been around for 30 years now. So really the question is how do we compute, a, or how do we construct a cactus? And there have been many algorithms again over the last 30 years. The best runtime at the moment is quadrating in the number of vertices. Again, exactly as in the local connectivity case, if you look at all these algorithms, they have the same recipe. I give you the input graph, you somehow list all the min cuts in the graph, and then put them back into a cactus. Now there could, this listing could be very succinct. There could be very succinct listings. Each min cut might be found by a very efficient algorithm. But there's this intermediate step of listing all the min cuts in all of these algorithms. Now, is there something very specific about the quadratic runtime? In the sense that if we want to improve the running time of an algorithm for finding all global min cuts, can we still follow the same recipe and make changes to how we list the min cuts or how we find min cuts? Or is the entire recipe going to get stuck at quadratic? In fact, we, it turns out that there's a significant 
fundamental barrier at quadratic runtimes. And it comes from the following single, simple algorithm, so, sorry, simple example. So here's a cycle. A cycle has just n edges, so it's linear number of edges. But how many min cuts does this cycle have? Well, I remove any two edges, that's a min cut for me. So it has n edges, but n square min cuts. Now if it has n square min cuts, then no matter how I list these min cuts, how I find them, I will at incur at least n square time in the intermediate phase. As long as I'm listing min cuts, I'm in trouble. So really, if you want to improve the runtime of finding all global min cuts in a graph, then we have to somehow get rid of this intermediate step. And the key structural property we prove is that it's not all these n square min cuts that are equally important. There exists a subset of linear number of min cuts, so of m min cuts, that encodes the structure of all the min cuts in a graph. This is the key structural property that helps us in reducing the runtime from n square. In fact, once we, once we have this property, the next question obviously is, if we can identify these min cuts, how do we find them? And it turns out that, again, the same technique as for Steiner connectivity works, and this is, uh, this is using tree packings. Now, there are many algorithms for tree packings. One algorithm that really works out well is something that I worked on in a separate project. It uh, does an arborescence packing in graphs. But that aside, when we put these two together, we get the first linear time algorithm for cactus construction, okay? or the first linear time algorithm to find all the min cuts in a graph. And of course, this cannot be improved except for logarithmic factors. We have to look at every edge at least once to find min cuts. Okay? So this brings us to the end of the first part of my talk on network analysis, and I'll pause for questions. All right, so let's move on. Let's move on to network design now. And here I will focus on the Steiner tree problem. So what's the Steiner tree problem? It's the most basic problem in any network design context. So I'm given a set of locations, let's say some Microsoft offices, and I want to connect them in a network. What's the cheapest way to connect them? So more formally, we'll look at an online Steiner tree problem. So all the terminals are not given to me in advance, but they come online. And how do we augment our Steiner tree to maintain optimal cost? So here's a formal definition of the problem. We are given an undirected graph offline, and this graph has edge and node cost. So every node has a cost, every edge has a cost. Online, we get a sequence of terminals. So we get a vertex, then another terminal, and so on. These are vertices in the graph. Now when terminal T sub i arrives, we have to connect it to the previous terminals by augmenting the graph we have already built. So here's where the algorithm is online. We can't throw away something we already bought. And of course, the objective is to minimize the cost. So to understand the problem and to, and to see a very simple first attempt, here's a greedy algorithm for, the, oh, by the way, I should mention that edge costs can be generalized by node, node costs. If an edge has cost C, I can always replace it by two edges with a node having cost C connecting them. And this is without loss of generality. So I'll only talk about node costs from now on. Yeah, but this increases the number of nodes by a lot. By, well, it, it makes it n plus m. But I mean, here we will get uh, algorithms which are polynomial at best. So I mean, it, yeah. I mean, these, these would be, a, the main focus will be on the competitive ratio, not on the running time. Yeah. All right, so here's a very simple algorithm for the problem. It's a greedy algorithm. I get a terminal, at this point I don't need to do anything, there's no constraint. I get a second terminal, I buy the cheapest path connecting my two terminals. In this case, it's a path containing the orange vertex and has cost one. I get a third terminal, I again buy the cheapest path connecting it to previous terminals. Again, I incur a cost of one. If I keep doing this for n terminals, then overall I have a solution which buys all these orange vertices and has a cost of n. On the other hand, if you, uh, if you see the optimal solution, that simply buys the blue vertex and has a cost of two. So clearly this greedy algorithm it does not work well. But the surprising fact is this is the best algorithm that was known for the problem. There was no sub-polynomial algorithm, competitive algorithm known for the online Steiner tree problem. So let's look closely at this algorithm. What's going on? Well, for every choice that the greedy algorithm makes, which is a greedy path connecting the current terminal to a previous terminal, the optimal algorithm also makes an alternative choice. Right? It also connects the current, algorithm, current terminal to a previous terminal. And the way we can analyze the cost of the greedy algorithm 
is by simply summing up the costs of the optimal algorithm of the choices that the optimal algorithm is making. Now, if the sum of these costs is at most rho times the optimal cost, then we can claim that the cost, the greedy algorithm is rho competitive, right? because on every rho, the greedy algorithm pays less than the optimal algorithm. Now, the key thing here is that when we sum the cost of the optimal choices, then even if a vertex appears on 10 of these paths, 10 of these optimal paths, we have to count the cost of the vertex 10 times because on the corresponding greedy choices, we have no guarantees of overlap. So, this is when we are saying we sum up the optimal costs, this is just a naive sum. Even if the same thing appears multiple times, we sum it up. Now, now if we use this recipe for the greedy algorithm that we showed, what happens? So, if you look at the optimal paths, these are the red paths, these are the choices the optimal algorithm makes. Now, the same blue vertex appears on all of these paths. So, while the optimal cost is just 2, when we sum up all these optimal paths, the cost becomes 2 times n, right? Because as I said, even if it is the same vertex, since it appears on all of these paths, we have to sum it up 10, n times. And that is where the competitive ratio becomes omega of n. But now, if, I, if someone gave me the liberty of taking out a vertex from the optimal paths, so I have to sum up the optimal paths, but I am allowed to do it after removing exactly one vertex from the, each path. If someone gave me this liberty, then in this particular example, I am in good shape, right? Because on all of these red paths, I will pluck out the blue vertex. The, vacuously, there's all the paths now sum up to some small value, in fact, zero in this case. And therefore, the cost of the greedy algorithm is, is small, provided we are allowed this extra liberty. In fact, very, sorry. So, I am saying that instead of the greedy property, if we make it a slightly weaker property, where on all these greedy paths, we do not need to sum up the cost of the paths, but we, we, can, we can identify a vertex on the path, say that I am not going to sum up the cost of this vertex. For everything else, I will have to sum up the costs. It is exactly one vertex that I am allowed to remove. It is not that you are really taking it out of the graph, it is just that you are not counting the… I am not counting the cost in the, in the, in the lemma. So, in this particular example, it works out. Now, very surprisingly, this works out in general. And here is the lemma. For any sequence of terminals, there always exists a set of paths and these think of these as the optimal paths, such that path P sub i connects terminal T sub i to a previous terminal and has the following property. If there always exists one vertex on each of these paths, such that if we remove that vertex from the path, then the cost of the remaining paths sums up well. So, in fact, the sum of cost of the remaining paths is at most log n times out. Okay. Re remember that if we were not allowed to take v sub i out of the path, then this sum would have been n times out. Okay. But if just taking out one vertex from every path, we bring it down to log n times out. And of course, these are vertices on an optimal, on an optimal, in an optimal solution, and therefore, the cost of these vertices overall is at most out when we are not double counting. If the same vertex is v sub i for 10 different paths, we take it just once. Okay? So, this is, we call this the almost greedy property, because it is just one vertex we have to remove. Now, what is, what is this property gaining us in terms of an algorithm? Well, think of, in general, when I get a new terminal, I have exponentially many choices of how I connect it to a previous terminal. If I had the greedy property, then when I get a new terminal, I only have one choice, it is the cheapest path to connect to a previous terminal. Here, I am some, sitting somewhere in between. If I can identify v sub i, then really I have just one choice. I will re reduce the cost of v sub i to 0 and take the cheapest path. But how do I identify v sub i? I do not know v sub i in advance, which means that I have n paths now, rather, which sits somewhere in between the exponential number if you had no properties and the one. A one exclusive path if we had the full greedy property. Right? So, for every terminal, we have now have n choices rather than one choice. And this lets us reduce the online Steiner tree problem to the online non-metric facility location problem. And if, if, you, if you know this problem, you, would, you, would, you can guess what is going on. The facility is this one choice that I make. There are n facilities. I make a choice of a facility. Once I have made that choice, the connection cost is fixed for me. Okay? It is not 
not exponentially many choices, but just polynomially many choices. And there were already algorithms for this problem, the online non-metric facility location problem, which lets us guess the first polylog competitive algorithm for the online Steiner tree problem. And in fact, this algorithm is optimal up to a log k factor, where k is the number of terminals. So moving on, oh, before, before I move on, I want to give you a very quick proof of how, how this property, uh, of, of the property that I showed, the almost greedy property. And here's a proof. So I define a spider as a tree where at most one vertex has degree greater than two. Okay? We call this vertex the head of the spider. All the leaves are called the feet of the spider and a path connecting a head to the foot is called a leg of the spider. So here's, I will prove the entire property in just one slide and here's the proof. We look at the optimal tree. This is the optimal uh, Steiner tree. On this, we first identify the vertices which are non-leaves but are terminals. Now these can be replaced by two vertices, one non-leaf, non-terminal vertex having the same cost as the original vertex and then a dummy terminal vertex which has cost of zero. Right? And this replacement is without loss of generality. Now once I have made this replacement, I do a recursive decomposition of the tree as follows. I find the spiders at the lowest level of the tree. Okay? So these are spiders at the lowest level. I look at the subsequence of terminals on any one such, uh, any one such spider. Okay? So T, T1 followed by T2 followed by T7 is the subsequence on the first spider. And then I define my paths from each of these terminals except the first one in the subsequence to the immediate predecessor in the subsequence. So T sub 7 goes up to the root and then goes down to T sub 2. The vertex that I will pluck out of the path, I define that as the root of these spiders. Once I have done this, I have gotten paths for T sub 2, 7 and 4. I remove these from my tree and then I simply recurse. I go through two more recursive levels and now I have got paths for all terminals except the first one. And on all of these paths, I have identified these vertices to pluck out. So at this point, I have identified the paths and the vertices. Now, do these paths sum up well if the vertices were removed? Well, yes, they do because there are at most log n levels. And on each level, every vertex except the root that I plucked out appears on at most two paths, one going down and one going up, which means that the total cost over all of these paths is at most log n times up, or twice log n times up. So that's the full proof. Now let's move on to a slight generalization of Steiner trees. The first general, uh, both, I'll talk about two generalizations. Both gen generalizations have the same basic structure. So instead of considering a monochromatic set of terminals, we split the terminals into multiple groups. Here there are two groups of terminals. Now the constraint based on this grouping of terminals is different in the two problems. In the first problem, called the group Steiner tree problem, the goal is to connect a representative terminal from each group. Okay? From each group, I am allowed to select any terminal, and then these representatives need to be connected in the cheapest possible manner. In the Steiner forest problem, we have to connect terminals internal to a group, but don't need to connect terminals across groups. Okay? So for example, whereas this one orange vertex is a solution, is a valid solution for group Steiner tree, it connects one uh, red terminal to one purple terminal. It's not valid for Steiner forest because it's not con connecting anything internal to terminal, internal to groups. Okay? So for Steiner forest, these two uh, uh, orange vertices are a valid solution. So these are two very standard generalizations of the Steiner tree problem. And we also give online polylog competitive online algorithms for these problems, except that the only catch being that the, these algorithms are quasi-polynomial time, whereas the previous algorithm, the algorithm I showed you in detail, the online Steiner tree algorithm is actually polynomial time. Okay. So now let's, let, me, let me move on to a slightly different conceptual generalization of Steiner trees. And these are called network activation problems, which I introduced recently. Now if you look at a Steiner tree problem, then one way of looking at it is the following. At every vertex, we have two choices. Either we pay a cost of zero, or we pay the cost of the vertex. Now if you look at any particular edge, I get the edge only if I choose to pay the cost of the both the vertices as it two ends. Right? 
So this is, this is just a different view of the problems we have been talking about. There are two choices at a vertex and edge gets activated provided I pay the cost at the two ends. Now in many situations things are slightly more general. For example in choosing powers of power levels of vertices and things like these. Instead of having two choices there are multiple choices at a vertex. And when is a edge activated? Well it's dictated by a general activation function which maps the choices I make at the two ends to whether the edge is active or not. And the only constraint I have is that it should be monotonic. If I decide to pay more, the edge shouldn't vanish. So under this, under this much more general model, can we solve Steiner tree problems or other problems, other network design problems? In fact, we show that uh, some very carefully chosen greedy algorithms can achieve logarithmic factors for a wide variety of network design problems, including Steiner trees, but also higher connectivity such as biconnectivity problems and so on and so forth. So is this natural question is, is this model uh, redundant? Is, is it exactly the same in computational power as the standard models that we have? But that is refuted by showing that for the minimum spanning tree problem, in fact in this model this problem is log n hard. It's NP hard, in fact log n hard, whereas in all standard models that we know of, this problem is very easily solvable in polynomial time. Okay? So there is a separation and uh, the separation is represented by this one problem. Of course, these are just the tip of the iceberg. There are many other problems one, one can explore in this framework and there has been some follow-up work looking at some other problems, but uh, a lot still needs to be done. So that is all I have to say about network design problems and again I'll pause for a short break if there are any questions. All right, so let's move on to the last section of the talk and this is about cut sparsification. So what is the cut sparsification problem? Well, the idea is if I'm given a very dense graph, can I sparsify it? So can I make it, if, for example, if the graph initially has roughly n square edges, can I reduce the number of edges to roughly nearly n in the number of vertices? And then for every edge that I retain in the sparsifier, I will make it a thicker edge, so I'll put a weight on it in order to ensure that for every cut, the weight of the cut is approximately preserved in the sparsifier. Okay. So I reduce the number of edges, make the edges thicker such that the weights of all cuts are preserved. So of course there's some combinatorial interest in this problem because it's not clear a priori that such sparsifiers even exist. But on top of that, it also has a significant algorithmic implication. So in almost all cut algos, so for example minimum cut, sparsest cut, max cut, etc., the running time tends to depend on the number of edges. This gives us a handle that can reduce the running time from depending on the number of edges to the number of vertices by sparsifying and then running the algorithm, except that in some cases we have to settle for an approximation whereas the problems were potentially exactly solvable in polynomial time. Okay. So this gives us a handle to trade off ac accuracy of the algorithm with uh, running time. So how would we sparsify a graph? Well the most obvious technique would be to simply uniformly sample all edges. We sample every edge at a probability which is dictated by how much we want to reduce the size of the graph. And the selected, if an edge is selected, we simply give it a weight of 1 over the sampling probability. So in expectation every cut is what it was earlier. Does this work? Well, not quite because of what are known as dumbbell graphs. So imagine that you have a graph where you have two, com two complete portions but that are connected by a single thin edge. If you sample all the edges at rate 1 over n, the graph for all you know gets disconnected. It almost always gets disconnected because the single edge is being sampled at a very small probability. So the natural fix is that this edge, the single edge that connects the two heavy portions must be sampled at a high probability and the two portions and the sides should be sampled at low probabilities. To put this in a formal language, the probability of sampling an edge should be dictated by the size of the smallest cut containing the edge. Or in other words, the smallest cut that separates the endpoints of the edge, which is the local connectivity of the edge. In particular, we should non-uniformly sample edges, where the probability of sampling an edge is inversely proportional to its local connectivity. If an edge has small local connectivity, for example, the connecting edge here, its probability is high. If it has low local connectivity, such as the edges in the two complete portions, then its probability of sampling is low. 
And of course, we want to make this unbiased. So instead of giving weights one, the same weight to every selected edge, we will give it a weight according to this probability of sampling. So that the expected weight of the edge remains one. Okay. So this is a scheme for sparsification. Does this work? Well, there are two things that we need to check. First, does it even produce a sparse graph? For all you know, all the edges are retained. Okay. It turns out that this is easy to show. You can show that the sum of reciprocals of local connectivities of all edges in a graph is at most n or n minus 1, which means that the graph we are getting after the sampling process is in fact sparse. But the trickier question is, is the weight of every cut approximately preserved? So is there, are, so as we saw in expectation every cut is preserved, but how about concentration bounds? And this is a question that was asked in the original seminal paper of Bengtser and Karger when they introduced sparsification and remained open for 15 years. Of course, there was, there was work on sparsification in these 15 years when people showed that instead of using local connectivity, if you use slightly more artificial parameters such as edge strengths or effective conductances, you would in fact get sparsifiers. But the original question stayed open until we showed recently that in fact this is true. So the conjecture was true. We, if you sample every edge by inverse of local connectivities, that works. And it's not just for intellectual curiosity, but this actually proves the previous theorems as well. I should mention here that effective conductance sampling also gets stronger properties, which we don't get. But for cut sparsification, the theorem that we show actually implies both the previous theorems and brings them under the same umbrella. The two previous results were incomparable. Also, this leads to better sparsification algorithms. In particular, we get the first linear time algorithm for cut sparsification. Recall that one of the uses of sparsification was to use it as a preprocessor and then run other cut algorithms. Now, of course, if the algorithm itself is not efficient, then you can't uh, have this recipe of using it as a preprocessor, right? That will become the bottleneck. So it's important to get sparsification algorithms that are efficient, and we get one that runs in exactly linear time. What were the earlier uh, runtimes? Uh, it was linear, and there were many logs after that, several logs. Do you explicitly compute the lambdas or you have to do that explicitly? No, so if you want to explicitly compute the lambdas, then we have to construct the gomery hood tree, which would take m times n time. So uh, instead of that, we use some structural insight from the proof to implicitly construct a different set of probabilities that, uh, that also give us sparsifier. So, yeah. So in the end, are you sampling with lambda e or the algorithm or sampling with a different? Sampling with a different set of probabilities. Really what we want is we need to sample with probabilities such that the probabilities sum up to something small and we get this concentration bound. So really it's a one-sided uh, bound that we want. We want the probability to be at least 1 over lambda e. But as long as the sum is small, we are happy to have higher probabilities. So we exploit that. The probabilities are at least 1 over lambda e. But, uh, but, but our individual probabilities might be higher than 1 over lambda e. All right, so I want to end with a general overview of, of, of my research. As I showed you, I have worked on several problems in graph connectivity. I'm also interested in online and stochastic problems, problems where the input is uncertain. And then I have worked on some modeling issues in online problems. I've also worked in specific optimization problems in the online framework, for example, load balancing and matching. These are resource allocation problems. And also on more applied problems such as news feed selection in social networks and so on. This also overlaps with web-based applications for which I have also worked in some search algorithms and also in some networking algorithms, for example, for long distance Wi-Fi networks, adaptive channel networks, monitoring and P2P networks. Okay. So this is sort of the general structure of what I work on. Some of, the, uh, some of the graph connectivity and online stochastic problems are more theoretical. Some of the parts, uh, other parts are more applied. But these are all algorithmic applications of uh, specific, ap specific uh, systems. Okay. All right. So I want to end with a couple of favorite problems. So here is one. And these are very concrete problems. So I have been telling you from the beginning that global min cuts are easy to compute. In particular, that we have linear time algorithms. But I have been cheating a little. This is true if we are happy with a Monte Carlo algorithm. 
if, if you don't want a certificate of that the algorithm is correct. But if you want a certificate, the runtime becomes much worse. So we really don't know how to efficiently certify min cuts in a graph. And this is one algorithm I would like to work on. Another important question that we don't know anything about is capacitated network design. In reality, network links, yeah, sorry. Um, I mean, you can have a Las Vegas algorithm that doesn't produce a certificate. Uh, but it, yeah, well, not explicitly perhaps, but by certificate, I mean it certifies correctness somehow. Uh, well, but still there has to be a proof. The fact that it terminates is itself a certificate that what you guys have to The algorithm itself is a certificate. The algorithm learning is not a certificate in the sense of like a problem having something that you can check. If he wants a zero error. I mean, the Monte Carlo algorithms would have a slight error, uh, slight probability of error. And I mean, one way of uh, one way of certifying it is to say that if we have a small error, we'll run something else. But still, I mean, we are certifying it somehow. Okay. The other problem I'm interested in is capacitated network design. So in reality, network links and nodes not only have costs, but they also have capacities. But in all classical network design questions, such as Steiner trees, capacities are completely ignored. Even for this very simple, apparently very simple question, I give you a graph, I give you a pair of terminals. What is the cheapest subgraph that can support a particular flow between these terminals? And we don't know the answer. We don't know any subpolynomial approximation for even this very simple looking problem. More broadly, I'm interested in exploring combinatorial structure of graphs to develop better algorithms for fundamental problems. And one thing I want to emphasize here is, I think simplicity of an algorithm is also a virtue that should be possible to trade off with things like more quantitative virtues like running time and but quality of approx approximation, competitive ratio and so on and so forth. So everything I've showed, for example, are, are very simple algorithms. There's, there's nothing complicated going on at all. I'm also interested in tech transfer between algorithmic theory and applications. Can we use this entire toolkit we have built over 30 or 40 years to solve various application oriented problems? And that's it. Thank you.